This next song is so true also. The chorus goes, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Many times we need to be reminded of that in our daily life. And so I pray that we can sing this as our prayer and know that God loves us unconditionally. Sing this chorus with me. It goes like this. He, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. When I fear, listen. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold, He will hold me fast. He will. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Those he saves, those he saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast, precious in his holy sight. He will hold me fast, he'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. Bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. He will. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. For my life he bled and died, for my life he bled and died, Christ will hold me fast, justice has been satisfied, he will hold me fast, rise with him to endless life, he will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to sight When He comes at last He will He will hold me fast He will hold me fast For my Savior loves me so He will hold me fast He will hold me fast he will hold me fast for my savior loves me so he will hold me fast for my savior for my savior loves me so he will hold me fast now as people said Amen. You may have a seat. Thanks so much for playing, guys. What a 
What a great day it's already been, amen? amen. And uh, I am so glad to, to be here with you and, and just even sing with you now. That's a real, real privilege. First time that I've been here at the church. I'm very thankful for Rick, for our friendship over the years. And I think it surprised me. I think I thought Rick had been here a lot longer, really. It's not been that long. So uh, we go way back, and so much happens through that time. But Rick, I'm so glad that you're here, brother, in the Central Valley and in Fresno, and we're grateful to God for you and thankful for what the Lord is doing at the life of this church. So as Rick introduced, I am down in Kingsburg. You probably know where that is, and we've been there for about eight years, just having a wonderful time serving the Lord in that town, and a grateful, wonderful privilege to be there, surrounded by, in that town, uh, many men who were in the agricultural business, specifically selling many of them stone fruit, and now developing almonds and all that. And uh, it's been a little bit of a change for me. I've usually been uh, uh, either in a main city and around a main uh, institution uh, graduate school that's been training men for ministry. And this is the first time I've kind of been separated from that for, for the most part for eight years. And I've really, really enjoyed it. So I've enjoyed working with the men in our church and it's a real privilege to be with you today. Um, grateful for that. Grateful they introduced me. I do have seven kids and uh, thankful for all seven of them. The last two are identical twin girls. And uh, what's interesting about my family, maybe I just share that with you, that's a lot of kids, seven years, but it, it's even more significant statement about my wife. We had those seven kids in nine years. And so by the time my oldest daughter was nine, uh, the twins came, and so we had the seven in nine years. In fact, that oldest daughter, Christine, her name is Christine Kramer, her and her husband are serving the Lord in Albania, and we are very, very grateful for them. Albania is just across the waterway there of Italy. In a, in a really a poor country in Eastern Europe. In fact, there's usually a, a fight at times between Albania and Moldova as the poorest countries in all of Eastern Europe, but that's where they're serving the Lord, and we're grateful. I mentioned Christine because they have four kids, and those are four grandkids of, of mine, of ours, and we're very thankful for them. In fact, I I brought a book today. I was just thinking about the range of music that we did today. Um, you know, just as you're singing, that first one, you called my name. I like that one. And I ran out of the grave. And I was thinking about my time when I came to Christ. I was 14. And in that sense, I mean, he sovereignly and uniquely uh, called my name. And for me, it was very, very distinct and very clear. I was shooting baskets in my driveway in the San Fernando Valley in a place called Canoga Park, and it was very distinct, almost, uh, well, I'd say almost charismatic-like in the sense, that, and, and yet not, I just was convicted of my sin. In fact, I remember the scripture sovereignly. James 2.10 popped into my heart. You might know that one by heart. For whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles at one point, he's become guilty of all. And it was almost like a harpoon came out of heaven and just pierced my heart because for the first time in my life, I realized I was a sinner and that it didn't take a big sinner to separate you from God himself. It just took one sin for whoever keeps the whole law, but just stumbles at one point. He's become guilty of the whole thing. And it, man, it almost just buckled me to my knees. And eventually, within two minutes, it did. I was in my room on my knees at my bedside, confessing Christ as my Lord and Savior. So I'm thinking of that song, You Called My Name, and he did, sovereignly. And then the, 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 the lyric said, and I ran out of the grave. And when I got up off my knees, the joy I experienced there was unbelievable. Because you, you say, what kind of joy? You're 14. I know I'm 14, 
but I was under condemnation all my life. And especially as a young teenager from 12, 13, 14, I did not want to submit my life to Christ. Um, and I carried a burden on my back all my life. So when he buckled me to my knees by his grace, when he called my name, I confessed Christ. But I remember getting up and having such joy when he redeemed me and saved me. And then we sang that last song. Uh, you know, you called my name, the first one. I ran out of the grave. That's true. But a picture of the Christian life was that third song is he will hold me fast. And I'm grateful because even though he calls us out of the grave, he's holding on to us, isn't he? And if it was up to us, we would be in big trouble. So one of the things I, I wanted just to begin with and maybe just to encourage you men a little bit. I was on vacation with all of my family in December. And uh, so we had all seven kids. It's kind of amazing. Uh, they mentioned a couple weddings. My daughter will get married in another one in May. So it's actually four weddings that I will have in a year and a half. And uh, it's amazing. But we were all there on vacation, which is really hard. My son's going to be an orthopedic surgeon. He's in Seattle. I have another son. My son, Johnny, runs Hume Lake that you're probably familiar with. He runs the high school. But they were all there, all the grandkids, all the Albania. And I've read this, this book to him. Have you ever seen this book? It's called The Dangerous Journey. And it, it, is, it is the book by John Bunyan of Pilgrim's Progress. And we had such a delightful time reading this story to our grandchildren. You should get it. You should read them. Because uh, every time we're together, I'm always trying to be in the scripture with them. But it's a book, Pilgrim's Progress, to which the great preacher C.H. Spurgeon read this book by Bunyan over a hundred times. So the, the book, Pilgrim's Progress, has been widely used. But here, subtitled, The Dangerous Journey, it's the it's the, the story of a man by the name Christian who's on his way to the celestial city. And as he's on his way to celestial city, he has to walk through the town called Vanity Fair. And it's gripping. And maybe this one has uh, pictures. I'll show it to you later. It has pictures in it of him on, on a precipice where there's just great caverns on his right and left as he continues to make his way to the celestial city. What's very interesting about that book is at the beginning of the book, he is carrying a great burden on his back. There's like a big 50-pound knapsack, burlap sack on his back. And uh, my kids, big, they call me Big Poppy. And uh, Big Poppy, why does he have that sack on his back? Well, he's carrying a burden. Well, what's a burden? Well, the burden is his sin. Well, Big Poppy, how come he's still got the, 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 the big sack on his back? Because he's carrying all the weight of his sin. Well, Big Poppy, when, when does that? And so I would have my older kids act the movie out, the book out every night, and it was just a joy. And finally, in the story, Christian came to Christ. His burden was removed, and, and then he's on his way to the, the celestial city. And the reason that I like that book is that I felt that burden keenly as a 14-year-old young man. I, I knew I was burdened, but I didn't want to submit to Christ. But I still remember when I bowed my knee and got up, that burden was removed. And yet, as we sang today here, it's not easy. You called my name and I ran out of the grave. That's true. But the other song is true. He will hold me fast because it's hard, isn't it, to live in this world as we make our way to that place called heaven. It's just true. I, I was looking last night. Somebody had sent me something. And by the way, this is not my message this morning. Rick did not tell me to, to speak on this. And so I'm, I'm delivering him. You could get upset at me and I don't want to spend too much time on this because that's not my point. We're, we're on the way to the celestial city and the pictures in there are graphic. It's like he, he's like walking a tightrope and, and you can see the city ahead, but he's on a precipice, 
because it's a picture of the Christian as he makes his way to the heavenly city. We battle so much, don't we? And so a friend sent me this last night, and I just use it here at the beginning for an introduction. Ten Ugly Numbers. It's by Tim Challies, if you follow Tim Challies' blog at all. Ten Ugly Numbers Describing Pornography. And I thought, I have my text for you, but I thought this leads right into it. And I don't want to overdo this, and I don't want to sensationalize this. But we live in a rough day, don't we, men, on, on the whole subject of pornography, the battle going on. I'm 57 years old. I would confess that I do not know and even claim to know what the young people are delving with. My youth pastor knows all of this, but I know enough of the subject of pornography. If you follow sports, you probably maybe somehow watched part of the Super Bowl at least a couple weeks back, but they would say the pornography business is, is bigger and larger than the NBA, the NFL, and Major League Baseball combined. Combined. And so we've got an epidemic here, far from the coronavirus, which sadly has killed a number of people all over the globe. The pornography business is eating people alive as we speak. In fact, here's what Charlie said, and this is not my message, but it says, Charlie said, in 2016, People watched 4.6 billion hours of pornography on just one website. I mean, there's hundreds of them, but 4.6 billion hours on one website. It's the largest website in the world, which I don't know its name, won't give you its name. He said that's 524,000 years of porn or if you will, around 17,000 complete lifetimes. I mean, this is just a struggle. I, and I praise the Lord he's going to hold us fast because when he called my name, I ran out of the grave. But you run out of the grave into what Bunyan would say is vanity fair. Charlie said this. He said at, this is just, he had 10, and I'm not going to give them all to you, 10 ugly numbers. One of them was 11, the number 11. At age 11, the average child has already been exposed to explicit pornographic content through the internet. At 11, he said 93% of the boys and 62% of the girls are exposed to internet-based pornography during their adolescent years and 22% of the vast quantities of porn are consumed by people under age 18. In fact, he said, as, as under 18 is consumed by those aged less than 10. So I'm sitting there thinking this morning, yeah, I ran out of the grave, but we run into this monster, at least this issue, and that's just one issue in Vanity Fair. Chalice gave another number. He said, and the number was 57%. So one was 11, the other one's 57. 50%, 57% of young adults admit to seeking out porn at least once a month. 57%, 46% of the men admit the same. So it's 57 for young adults, 47, 46% of men admit the same. I mean, it's staggering. He, he went on to say, gave another number, 61% or of, of pornography is watched on the what? <laughs> on the mobile phone. I mean, I grew up in the generation, probably a lot of you guys, you, you couldn't do that, right? I mean, you had to have access or somebody had to have access to some kind of picture. But what we've ended up in our own generation here is the mobile phone has become a transmitter to make it very difficult to get to the celestial city uh, for believers. 61%, and of course this is not related to men only. It's a difficult battle. In fact, 33 is another number. 33% uh, of women today, age 25 and under, go search searching for porn at least once a month. 
So listen, men, uh, maybe that's enough. This is a battle here. And, and the theme here at breakfast is living well. How do you live well? How do you focus on the person of Christ in light of the, the, the arena in which we live? I, dr- I was driving here uh, this morning, and I think I turned left. I forgot where it was. But there on the corner was this uh, uh, business called, am I saying it right, Mooses, M-U-S-E-S, and subtitle, Spa and Well-Being. <laughs> Spa and Well-Being. And I thought, okay, they're helping the outer person. They're, they're trying to help people live well. But men, in our desire to live well, I want to turn us to, to the Word of God. And th- th- so I say all that to, to ask you, if, you, if you brought your Bible, to turn over to Romans chapter 12. How do you live well? I came out of the grave. He called my name. I ran out of the grave. I, I, that was true of me. But we're walking on this precipice ready to fall off in the difficulty of this world, how do you live well? Well, there's a statement in there in Romans chapter 12 that I want to alert our attention to. And if you've been in Christ for any amount of years, this is a familiar text to you. Um, If you're struggling with the ideal of worldliness, then... Uh, then this is going to help you. Um, whatever it might be, I was just thinking even at the Super Bowl, I, I'm not trying to be legalistic, I went out during the, the halftime show. Because I'm not going to, I, I mean, I, if there's anything <laughs> of Vanity Fair, it's the Super Bowl, the largest watched event in the world. And they're going to put out as much th- as they can at the Super Bowl, at the halftime show. Um, and I just... I just, I, I didn't watch it. I knew my wife wouldn't want to watch it. And, uh, and so I just simply left the room at that moment in time. Man, how do you live well in a shark-infested water? That, that's our subject. And, and I bring you to Romans 12, 1 and 2. Let me read it. And just a few comments, and then I'll put you at the table. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present... Interesting. Your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And here's where I want to focus, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So how, how do you live well? Well, it's right here. And, and we'll just keep it simple today. And I'm just going to focus on verse 2. He tells you something that you must avoid, okay, in your life. And then he tells you something that you must advance. Something you've got to avoid. And then something you've got to advance. And, and the focus there is in verse 2. Because the thought would be, in verse 1, he tells us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. I think it's interesting, just just for you, for my own heart, that he gets done with Romans 1 through 11, and you know it. He says, by the mercies of God. In other words, in response to the mercies of God, and the mercies of God in verse 1 are of 12 1 are all the great doctrines of Romans 1 through 11 justification sanctification glorification adoption the spirit's role all of those things are the mercies of God and he appeals by those mercies in other words always our external conduct comes out of a posture of what God has done for us always that way you don't end up with legalism. Paul doesn't begin Romans, the book, with Romans 12. No, 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 never his pattern. He always spends the first half, and in this book, the first 11 chapters, giving doctrine, 
your position in Christ. And then when he gets to the practical part, he tells you what you must do. But what you must do is always built off, built off who you are. That way we don't keep these things externally. And what I'm saying to you today isn't external. But he does begin with this. That you're to present, you're to make a presentation of your body as a living sacrifice. That because of your high position in Christ, you come to the place because he called you out of the grave. And because you ran to him, you now are a different man. You're a new man. You're a new creation because of those mercies. And you give your body to God. I still think it's interesting. In fact, I'm really doubly down interested in Titus that when he deals with the subject of various people in the church there, he deals with older men, right? You know the passage, Titus 2. Then he deals with older women. Then he deals with younger women. And then he deals, fourthly, with young men. And what's fascinating is he says a lot to the older men of their characteristics. He says a lot of things to what the older women need to be. The older women, thirdly, are then training the younger women, and the younger women are given seven qualities that mark out a younger woman. But when he gets to the young man, he just uses this word, tell the young men, do you know this one? To be sensible. And that's it. That's the only thing he tells a young man. Because if a young man can live within self-control, he's going to live out the faith that called him in Titus chapter 1. So I think it's interesting here. He says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And the question would be, how do you do that though? Well, certainly it's based on the mercies of God very well. This was just our thought. You, you live out a living sacrifice that doesn't crawl off the altar, okay, that, that's, that's a living sacrifice, it's daily, he says, which is holy, in other words, it's separated from the world, it's acceptable to God, which is a form of spiritual worship, still blows me away. We can worship this morning in song with these brothers, and we did, but you ever consider what you do with this body, this carcass, is an act of spiritual worship, so okay, Scott, what do I do? Well, there, there's something you got to avoid, number one. And secondly, there's something that you need to advance. Number one, just, just, just to, uh, to fuel our thoughts this morning and fuel my own heart this morning, there's something, there's an enemy you've got to avoid. Here's Christian on his way to the celestial city. He walks through this town, Vanity Fair, that is just clamoring after him. I think Bunyan has pictured the world and the city of Vanity Fair just calling to Christian. And he's, well, we live in that world. What, what do we got to avoid? Look at the text if you have your Bible or if it's turned on. He says, you got to avoid something. He says, do not, verse 2, be conformed to this world. There's something you got to do. If you're going to live holy, you've got to avoid this. And I don't need to go into all of it. There's different usages of the word world. What do, you, what do you mean, do not be conformed to this world? Well, number one, three usages in the New Testament is the created world. You say, what does that mean? In Acts 17, 24, God who made the world and everything in it. Sometimes the Bible just uses the word world as the created world. He's, he's obviously not talking about that. You and I live in the world. Secondly, sometimes that word world is used of the human race. It speaks of uh, Mark 14, 9, that the gospel would be proclaimed in the whole world. So sometimes it means the created world. Sometimes it just speaks of generally the human race, okay, um, the world of human race. But thirdly, the, the word world, and here in Romans 12 too, speaks of, a, of a, the world of a fallen group of people. That, that's the issue here. It speaks of an evil system. It speaks in the scripture of man's refusal to, to bow to God. It is 
characterize the world, the word world here as self-righteousness, self-centeredness, self-promotion. And in this sense, we're not to be conformed to the world. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this, what? World. It's not of this system. It's a system of unrighteousness. It's the, the word. It's a system of ungodliness. And we're not to be conformed to the world. And certainly there's the problem. We do live in it. And Jesus said in John 17, 15, I do not ask to take you out of the world, but that you be kept from the evil one. So there's the problem. We live in this world. We live in this system. Jesus prayed not to take us out of it, but to be kept from the evil world. Let let me just note a few things on this thing we must avoid, okay? Number one, uh, hear me on this. It's in the text. It's it's a negative command. You say, what do you you mean? Well, you can see it there in verse 2. He tells you something you got to avoid. He tells you that there's something, if you want to live as a living sacrifice, there's some things you've got to avoid. And and number one, I'd say it's a negative command, do not be. You know, it's interesting, and I'm not going to be a harper here, eight out of the ten commandments are negative in nature. I mean, the truth is, if we're going to live righteous, if you're going to live righteous, there's some things I can't do, and there's some things you can't do. So, so I, I just note here, it is somewhat negative to be a living sacrifice. There are some things that must be avoided. You say, well, like what? Well, secondly, it's not only a negative command, but look again at verse 2. It's a specific command. It says there in verse 2, do not be conformed. Conformed. And I love words. What does it mean to be conformed? The the word there just means, it it literally means adoption, okay? It's the idea of, even a better word, is imitation. So it speaks of adopting the world, or secondly, imitating the world. But but really, there's another word that kind of carries the idea of posing is the word, like the world. And so what Paul is saying here, it is a negative command, but it is a specific command. In other words, do not allow yourself to be molded after the fashion of this world. In other words, if you want to be, in Paul's words, a living sacrifice, then stop imitating and stop masquerading in the things of this age. In fact, Peter said it this way, in 114, as obedient children, do not be conformed, squeezed, molded, stop posing um, after the passions that were once yours in ignorance. In fact, one translation says here of verse 2, it's the Phillips translation, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. In other words, men, if we're going to be a living sacrifice, we can't look like the world, talk like the world, act like the world, be like the world, love the world's entertainment, love the world's um, media, if you will. I remember, men, when I was a, I don't know, I I think I was a young boy, and we went to the place, the L.A. Zoo. Have you ever been to the L.A. Zoo? How many of you? Sometimes we'll take the grandkids up to the one in Fresno and like the one in Fresno. But when I was a young boy, every time we went to the zoo, there was something I wanted there. And what I wanted there was was one of those wax animals. Do you guys remember that? You'd go to the machine. it, It was a pretty decent amount of money at that point. And it was a machine that would make you a wax animal of the LA Zoo on the spot. So you you put your quarters in on the machine and then you punched out the number of the animal that you wanted to be made for you. And this is how it would be made. There was a mold in that machine and then from that mold hot wax would run into that thing. So if you picked a tiger, you tiger 
out came the color of the tiger in the, of the hot wax. And the hot wax, and you could watch it in front of you many years ago, would be put into that mold and then it would cool and out would come at the bottom of that tray the animal that you desired. There's a bit of that when I think of this thought here is that you can't be squeezed into that. We're called to live differently, aren't we men? So here it is. It's a negative command. It's a specific command. Do not be conformed. And then I'd say this thirdly. It's a directed command to not be conformed. And then he, he isolates it to this world. Don't become conformed and put into a mold after this age. Because this age is in opposition to the kingdom of God. Obviously, the believer, the man of God is to be different. Romans 8, 29, we're to be conformed to the image of his son, not the world. And uh, that's the goal. And so the world there is this present sinful age in which we live. And I think you men know 2 Corinthians 4, 4 calls Satan the God of this, what, world. So you, you've been called to, to be different. In fact, Paul said in Galatians 1, 4, who gave himself for our sins, he said to deliver us out of this present evil age, which age is the word for world. Guys, we shouldn't be like it. So listen, when he called me out of the grave, I like that song. I ran, but, but we were also called into a battle, were we not? And if you're going to live righteously in this battle on the way to Celestial City, there's a negative command, there's a specific command, there's a direct command to not be and live like this world. Listen, I, you know, I'm, I'm just glad you're here and you're at some tables today, but this stuff ought to be just talked about. This really ought to be talked about. And I'm not trying to put anybody in an uncomfortable situation today, but you'd be crazy to live like this and not get some accountability on whatever the facet of the world is. And I'm not isolating pornography here. But I'm, I'm thinking of a friend of mine who I pastored. Rick mentioned it, was, it wasn't Ohio. It was actually the Midwest, which is close. I was in Chicago. And I remember talking to a guy. He was a friend. I call him a friend in my church. He was in my church, but he's my friend and had a, a household of kids. And I remember one time he came and confessed to me what he was doing. And I told him, thank you. And I, I said, I'm so sorry to hear that. Here's what he told me. We were in Chicago. And if you were to make your way north, there was a place above us called Wisconsin. And uh, he had a place up there, a, a home, a cabin. And, and he confessed to me. He said, you know, Scott, sometimes I I drive up there, and, um, and there's these places off the side of the road, and you and I know what he's talking about. I'll just leave it at that, because I would see the billboards when I'd go up there. It just pull over here, you, you get it, triple X and all that. So I said, well, what's going on? He says, well, he, uh, he told me that oftentimes as he's on his way up to that place, he would pull over there and pull off the off-ramp and, you understand, go, go into one of those places. And that's all I need to say. And, but I, I want to tell you something I asked him. I, I said, um, hey, I, I just forgive me. I just, I want to know, I, I want to help you. I want to pray with you. I said, I... I, for me, I'm just wondering, those places have cameras all over the place. And, uh, and I said, you, you've got to be, I mean, do you ever just fear like you're going to get seen? Do you ever fear like somebody's going to see you that you know in Chicago, not too far to go up there? He goes, yeah, I do. I go, well, I mean, I just wonder that. I just fear, I mean, we've got all these cameras. I said, you do fear that? He goes, yeah. I said, so what do you do? I mean, do you just walk through that fear, get out of your car and go in? And he says, no. I mean, he's just real honest with me. He said, I, I wear a hat. 
I said, you wear a hat. He said, yeah, I wear a hat because the cameras are coming down, right? And he said, secondly, I wear a pair of sunglasses. And I was very thankful for his honesty to me. I said, well, hey, maybe this is a step. But it was hard for me to think that his whole life was viewed before an almighty, omniscient, omnipresent God to think that he could wear a hat and put a pair of sunglasses on so that nobody would recognize him while he committed all of his sin in the eyes of a holy God. Listen, men, and, and I, that's a dear friend even to this day. So I think what I'm telling you is this. You can't be a living sacrifice. You can't understand even the mercies of God that called you out of the grave and walk into that filth and not be tainted by it. So men, listen, there's something you've got to avoid and it's being fashioned and formed and framed by this, by the world, by what is the world, by the system, by the entertainment, by the media, by the movie industry, by the pornography industry. I'm just being honest with you. I mean, you can run out of the grave. I did when he called my name, but listen, you get in this thing on the way to Celestial City, like the third song painted, it's not easy, and we need to put the one another's in the practice. Do you remember? You probably know it by heart. John the Apostle said, do not love the world. He said, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father, what? Is not in him. So you can't love it. doesn't mean you're not going to be affected by it. You say, well, can a believer be affected by the world? Well, uh, listen, I, I jotted a few down. Number one, Adam compromised God's clear command, followed his wife's sin, and brought the whole world into sin. Sarah compromised God's word and sent Abraham to Hagar, who bore Ishmael and destroyed peace in the Middle East to this day. Moses compromised God's command by striking the rock and failed to enter into the promised land. Numbers 20. Samson, Samson compromised, was impure with women and a woman, lost his strength, his eyesight, and his life, though used by God. Saul compromised by sparing the animals of his enemy and lost his kingdom. I, I could go on, I'll stop. You got, there's something you got to avoid. But secondly, here's positive. This is really, this is really what I wanted to tell you. How, how do I live righteous here? Well, you, there's something to advance. Look at the text. He says, but be, I love this statement, transformed by the renewing of your mind. I want you to connect the dots here. Paul moves from a presentation of the body in verse 1 to a separation from the world in verse 2. And here it is proactive, thirdly, to a transformation of your mind. So there it is. Presentation, okay? Separation from the world and a transformation of your mind. That word there, men, in verse 2, it's, it's a word that we use even in our English. It's the Greek word metamorphou. Metamorphou. We obviously get the word transformed. Our English word metamorphosis from it. The word literally means to be changed into another form. Okay? In fact, we use that word today when a tadpole becomes a what? A frog. When a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, they metamorphose, if that's the proper way to say it. Um, he says... Don't be squeezed into the world. Proactively, positively, it's really, really where my heart was. To be transformed, to be transfigured, if you will. And, and it always speaks in the New Testament of being transformed from the inside out. So don't be conformed to the external pressure of the world. Be transformed, the thought of the word of God is, from the inside out. So I love Paul. Here's, you got to be separated, present your body, if you will. You got to make a presentation, then you got to separate what to avoid, but what to advance here is this transformation. Now, how is one transformed? Look at the text again in verse 2. 
by the renewal or the renewing of your mind. Let me put the pieces together. Take your body and make it a living sacrifice. Take your mind and be renewed and be renewed from the inside out. So watch this, men. If you're going to live well, there's a rejection of the world. We get that. But there's a renewal of the mind, if you will. And you ask, how is the mind renewed? And of course, the mind is renewed by the power here of the Word of God. This is what he's addressing here. The outward transformation is affected by the renewing internally of the mind of the word of God. So that men, God, God's word is the instrument that the spirit uses to renew our minds. Put the dots together to be a living sacrifice. You must be renewed by the word of God. So here's the implication. This, even if you just got this, it's worth it. Your mind controls your body. That, that's the essence of the teaching here. Now there's a lot I could say there. What you and what I do and put in our mind controls your body. Now the world lives out of control, without self-control. But a believer is called to live with sensibility and here, your mind controls your body. You present your body, but here you renew your mind. Now, men, obviously, when you were born again, you became a new creation. I did, you did, changed at salvation. However, you also know, as we sang this morning, that we ever need to be renewed into the likeness of Christ through the Word of God by the Spirit of God. The, the Word of God talks a lot about um, the, the, the old man who was controlled, okay, by these false things. Let, let me just tell you a few things there, and then I'll send you to the tables. What, what, what else would you say about verse 2, be transformed? Can I, can I just help you there a little bit? It's not rocket scientist, but let me tell you about the word transformed just like the word conformed, and there's meanings to that, but positively, for you guys to live well, for me to live well, you've got to be transformed. Number one, the command here, it's a command in verse two to be transformed, just so we're on the same page. It, it's present tense, okay? Present tense. You say, well, uh, Scott, what does that mean? Continue is the idea. It's a present tense command. Continue to let your mind be transformed. This thing of advancing, this ideal of living well, is not on again, off again. This is to be our continual practice to let your mind be transformed. Enough for me to say, man, and I'm laughing saying this, you're not transformed once for all. You know that and I know that. But sometimes I hear people say, ah, if you could just get the second blessing of the Spirit, if you can just get the filling of the Spirit, if you could just make this thing called a holy hop, you reach a place where, it, you know, in the Christian mind and the secular mind, you reach nirvana. There is no place called that. You enter this life and he saves you. He calls you out of the grave. You run to joy with him. But I'm telling you, strap on your armor at that point. And then here, you've got to be transformed in the thinking cap because the thinking cap's going to control your body. So men, it would be enough for me just to say gently to you, what you do with the word of God in the next two years will tell me about how well you're really living. And this is an encouragement to you, okay? But it's a, it's a present tense. Secondly, I don't mean to add too much in here, it's an imperative. It's present tense. So the command is present tense, but it's a present tense imperative. In other words, men, from my heart to your heart, this is not an option for you, okay? 
This is a command given to you by God to saturate your minds in the Word of God. So be obedient to it. And maybe thirdly, the thing that's most interesting to me, it's kind of bizarre. Say, so what's bizarre? It just means to be transformed. Well, it's the present tense. Secondly, it's a command. But thirdly, in the Greek language, there's voices. Not weird voices, but voices of, of active and of passive. If somebody's active, they're active in the action. If somebody's passive, the action is being done to them. Does that make sense? What, what fascinates me here, you probably think be transformed, is active. And you're wrong, and I was wrong. It's passive. It's passive. So what it means here is this. Let yourself be transformed. You don't transform yourself. You let yourself be transformed. So I can give you a stupid illustration. When I was young, I was growing up sometimes as a young boy in San Fernando Valley, and this show came on on Saturday. Do, do you remember the show? It was called Shazam. Does anybody remember that show, Shazam? It was much like Superman. Superman, The guy would go, in essence, into a phone booth, and he would just spin and spin and spin and spin. I shouldn't do it too much. And spin. And then he'd pop out of the booth, and he would yell, Shazam! And he would turn into, in essence, a superhero. I think a lot of people think the Christian life is like that, and it's not. Here, here's the radical thought by Paul. As you put yourself under this book, it will wonderfully transform you into a man of God. You do not, if I could say it this way, shazam yourself. All you have to do is to let the word work. And if you're in it, it's going to transform you from one state of glory into the next to the point where the word is passive. I mean, I'm just thinking, you're thinking, you got to do something. You're thinking, I want to motivate you. I don't. If we could get a big win here at this breakfast, it would be this. What are you doing with the word of God? Because you say, Scott, what do you do? I have something I do to not be a professional preacher. I uh, have a Bible app. And I just read through the McShane Bible reading app daily. It gives me about four to five chapters. That's just like an easy Bible reading, reading uh, app. But, you know, my, other, my kids are reading 10 chapters a day. They're on the Grant Horner 10 chapters a day plan. Listen, men, I don't care if you're new in Christ or if you're old in Christ. You will be nothing other than what you do with the Word of God. You take your body, you make a presentation... You, you take, how do you do that? You avoid being conformed, and then you here positively become transformed. How can a young man, you know it, Psalm 119, how can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to your, what? Your word. Remember Psalm 119, I think it's 11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not, what? Sin against you. Man, you either put the word there and it becomes a barrier for my heart, your heart, or you become squeezed into the mold of the world. I mean, I would just tell you as a pastor, not to violate any confidences, this stuff on pornography is eating people alive. It's eating young people alive. In fact, my youth pastor told me the other day, he, he, my nickname is Ardo. He goes, Ardo. He goes, what? He goes, even at my kid's elementary school, he said third graders are holding iPhones. It's worse than a gateway drug here. You're, 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 you're manipulating minds. And I'm just telling you, as a guy that's been in ministry, the goal of Planned Parenthood is three abortions by the time that high school girl's 18. And if you think I'm joking, I'm not joking. And if you think their materials are just in the high school, you're wrong. And if you think Planned Parenthood is in middle school and junior high, you're wrong. They're in the elementary school. They're systematically promoting sexual impurity with a goal that they could have three abortions by the time they're 18. It's a money-making scheme. 
And listen, your kids and my kids and your grandchildren, they're living in this. But listen, the hope is, is a renewed mind. So men, here's just the one takeaway today. Uh, this. What are you doing with this book? And if you're in this book and you're walking with it, praise the Lord. If you're not in this book, find some accountability today to, to be in this book. All is not lost here. I'm just in the passage in my exposition at Grace on John 21 coming up when God restored Peter. He restored Peter after a triple denial, didn't he? He put him back. Do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he took Peter's confession and made him the great preacher in the book of Acts. Listen, it's not too late. In fact, this is a, I don't know if I should say that. I feel like I'm warning you today. But man, just love the word of God. Just love the word of God. I don't care if you're old. I know a guy in my one church who said when he was 50, he wasted his life. And so he began to be a godly man at that point and a man of, and a prayer warrior and all those things. But listen, there's hope, men. But you're sitting around the table. I had a bunch of stuff, but we're out of time. What you can do, let me just remind you of this too, just so I'm not weird. The only reason I'm exhorting you is all of this is built off the mercies of God, isn't it? The only reason we should ever obey the Lord and please the Lord is because of what he's done for us. So listen, you avoid the world because of his mercies. You avoid the world. You, avoid, you walk that tightrope onto Vanity Fair because of his mercies. And when we become so in love with the fact that he redeemed us, that he saved us, that he wiped our sin out, that he forgave us all of our sins, past, present, and future even, once you see those mercies, then you'll want to please the Lord that you love. Man, listen, I, I probably, I have no idea where any of you are. Rick, he, you didn't tell me anything, did you? In fact, I texted Rick last night. Is this okay? He said, run with it. It's just on my heart. But listen, what you do with this book will determine your next three years. What you're sons and daughters, granddaughters, grandsons do with this book will determine their life. What they sit under here with Rick preaching, if you're in this church, will determine the health of this church going forward. But men, listen, you say, I want to change. I want to be different than, than I'm thinking there of uh, Psalm. What was it? Uh, Psalm, How can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word? I have stored up in your your word in my heart that I might not, what? Sin against thee. Final thought. Somebody told me this once, and I think it's true. You can only put one thing in your mind at a time. Oh, we can multitask. But you're either fixed on sin or you're fixed on the word of God. And when you and I fix on the word of God, then sin will begin to, to draw low. Let me pray for you, and then I'm going to dismiss you to tables. Father, help these men. Of course, help my own heart. Father, I've not made it. I want, I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I'm a young man, and many of these men are young men, and some are older, but Lord, we want to make it all the way to your kingdom. Would you give us a, an accountability one to another? Lord, um, you called our name. I ran out of the grave, but I'm so thankful that you hold us. I'm so thankful that for some reason, these men showed up today. And I thank you that they're here. Thank you, Lord, for the transforming power of the word of God. That, Father, we can hide your word, memorize it, put it in our heart that we might not sin against thee. Lord, it's hard, but would you bring about well-being to our life? Father, we don't need a spa. We need transformation of the word of God. Help us to that end. Guide these men at these tables now in your name. Amen.